but it seems so complex. This is one of the, uh, a lesson I taught at a conference one time, a long time ago. Uh, we're going to turn it, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, 15 and 46. This is one of those, there are scriptures in the Bible that you need to underline, mark, put highlight on it and everything else. This is one of them, one. There are certain, there are a lot of scriptures that give you a lot of deeper understanding. And I think one of those scriptures is this one right here. And that's in first, I will keep on saying Isaiah. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 46. And how be it that was not first, which is spiritual. That's very important. That, w that was first was not spiritual. So when I'm dealing with this Bible, I need to understand that the first order of things is not a spiritual thing. It's more natural. It's about natural stuff. Got that? Okay, so he goes on and says, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. In other words, God first paints you a picture that's natural. Some people call it literal. Okay? A literal picture. But that is not the story. The full story is what has been revealed in the spirit. That which was first, the first man, was a literal, natural, dirt man. Second man, the Bible says, came from heaven, so it was a heavenly man. It wasn't just a human being. He came from heaven. The Bible say that which was first was natural. Next man is going to be a spiritual man. That's why you have an old covenant and you have a new covenant. The first covenant is a... There you go. See, you're getting it. See that? You, you jumped on it real good. Natural covenant, right? And the second covenant is going to be what? Okay, so I'm not going to be able to understand the natural or understand the spiritual by totally believing in the natural because I need to have a revelation of that. I need to know how that natural picture is played out in the spirit. First king of the earth. You know who that was? First king? No. Adam. Huh? He was a natural king. You say, well, how do you know he was a king? Because the Bible said, I have given you dominion. You can't have a domain or a dominion without, without having a kingdom. So the first king of the earth was natural, which his name was Adam. That's really why when you get into the lessons of the old covenant, you notice one thing. The first son of Abraham was not spiritual. Guess what he was? Natural. Understand. Notice that not one time in the Bible, this is, you need to understand this, not one time in the Bible did any man's firstborn son ever become a king. If you notice in the kings of Israel, the first king was named Saul. He was natural. How did I know he was natural? Because his anointing came from a man-made vase. David's anointing came from a sacrificed lamb horn. The first king of Israel had to decrease so that the second king, which was going to be an eternal kingdom, had to increase. All through the Bible, you keep seeing the same picture. Cain was the firstborn. Guess what? He's a natural. Even in the book of Jude, it tells you going after the will of Cain. All you got to do is know what natural is. Study these people that was painted this natural picture. There's certain things about their nature that doesn't jive with God. So 
the scripture tells us that which was first was not spiritual. That which was first was natural. So we need to look at these natural things because, you know, when I came into the church, first thing he told me, you know, the Old Testament is, is uh, got the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Remember hearing all that? But even after we said that, we really didn't know exactly what we were really saying. We was always saying that the, old, the New Covenant is contained in the Old and it's been revealed in the new. And so, knowing how this being revealed, first thing we need to do always, always allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. That's the key. Always allow Scripture to interpret Scripture because otherwise we have a private interpretation. If Jennifer over here is using Sears and Roebuck catalog, and I'm using the Bible, you think we're going to come together on that. That's just about how far it is from natural to spiritual. One using a series of robot catalog and the other trying to use the Bible. That's why many times when I see these people writing these books on prophecy and writing books about end time and writing books about all this, it's if they looked in the Bible and found it. I know they didn't. They tried, I got a book in here right now somebody sent out to me, America in prophecy. America is not in prophecy because it was never written to America. Nope. So if you tell me you see that, I know you're lying. You got to have a private interpretation to get that because that's not Bible. You got to understand one thing. Everything that these prophets prophesied in the Old Testament, they didn't even know what they was talking about themselves. We're going to look at the scriptures. Let's look in the scriptures now. Let's let the Bible be our commentary. You don't have to argue with the word. We can't argue with the word. We can't. No, I can't say we can't. We're doing it every day. Every time I get on Facebook, I find so many different arguments. Everybody's fighting for something. Everybody's fighting to do something. Everybody's fighting to hold on to something. Everybody's fighting and trying to say who's right, who's wrong. There ain't but one right. There ain't but one right. And you're on as right as you're in the right one. If you don't believe in the right one, you're not believing right. And everybody believes. Now, everybody that goes to church believes they believe in right. Right? Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be going to church if I didn't believe I was right. Would you? I, I believe I'm right. But I need to base my faith or my belief on being right on having the right interpretation. Otherwise, I could be sincerely wrong. I don't think there's anyone that reads the Bible that walks away and say, well, I don't believe in God. I don't think that, uh, well, let me just say this, because I think what we really have done over the years is we try to take the Bible to prove there is a God. The Bible was never given to prove there was a God. That's not what the Bible was for. Otherwise, Abraham would have needed a Bible. Noah would have needed a Bible. How many Bibles do you think they read? Huh? So, they were believing in God before it had the King James. <laughs> right? Okay, don't get scared. No, they were believing in God. So, my faith, this Bible is not to prove God. This Bible, what it does to me is when I read what he's done, it just really helps my faith to believe even more in God, but it doesn't prove God. God doesn't try to prove himself. As a matter of fact, you can get mad right now, shake your fist at the heavens and say, prove yourself to me. He don't have to prove himself to anybody. He's going to be a God whether you believe or not. It, does, it doesn't change God because you don't want to believe in him. He said, even though you deny me, he said, I won't deny myself. So you don't have to worry about God being God. God is God. There's none like it. So when we look at the old, we can only explain it by the new. This reason why many people run into a lot of trouble because we're always picking through the ordinances of the law to try to figure out which one we should have kept. 
right? Some people have a diet thing about the Bible. They don't eat certain foods because the Bible declared it was unclean. Some of us don't give a hoot. <laughs> but we will go crazy on another scripture that we may be amen in, but yet there are these other ones in here that if you literally took them like you literally take the other ones, see, bacon wouldn't be good at breakfast. We wouldn't have ham on Christmas. I've never been able to understand how that we really go crazy over our Jewish carpenter Savior and then celebrate him with a pork chop. No, I'm serious. I mean, if, you, if you're going to get real serious about the Bible and knowing that pork was an abomination, now don't get, I ain't trying, don't go and throw away your pork chops. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. But what I'm trying to show you is that if you're going to take everything in there literally and do it to the letter, because letter means literal, all right? And so when you do it by the letter, you're going to do it literally. And if you do one part literally, you need to do it all literally because if you don't, missing one part, it kind of like this and all the whole thing. So the Bible says if you miss it in one place, it's like you have broke it all. So the people who really want to be literal by the letter, make sure you do it by the letter. You better go back to it and comb real carefully. Because I can assure you there's a lot of things you're doing right now, literally, you should not be doing. But if I don't have the understanding of what the old covenant was and how this old covenant is going to be revealed in the new covenant, if I don't have that understanding, I'm constantly going back to the old covenant and trying to figure out what part of that I can keep and, and find the grace of God. Can I tell you one secret here? You're not going to find the grace like that. You know why? Well, I'll tell you in a few minutes. Don't let me get ahead of myself. I'm trying to make this last tonight. So let's look at Romans. Here we got these great apostles now. And many, many people really admire them, and I do too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I, I thank God that we had those. Matter of fact, in John 17 and 20, Jesus made a very powerful statement. I've used it many times when I was uh, teaching a lot of home Bible studies and trying to uh, teach about salvation. One of the things that always grabbed me was this scripture right here. You know, many people say, well, I, I want to pray the Lord's Prayer. Well, if you're going to pray the Lord's Prayer, this is, this is his prayer. <laughs> this is his prayer. Let, let me just turn to it in my Bible. I just wrote the one verse, and I think I want to But he said, neither pray I for these alone, but for those, for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So that means that now they're going to have a word that I need to hear. And whatever they're going to be speaking, I need to believe. Because he's praying for them that they might receive it and everybody would hear them will receive what they're saying. Do you agree with that? Yes. All right, so it's very important what the apostles say because what they say means something. The unity of the Spirit is based upon us believing what they told us, all right? And so he, he said, I'm praying not just for them, but for everybody that will believe in me through the word. That's why, you know, people argue about baptism. People argue about every kind of thing and argue about how she's be baptized. Well, that's real simple. I don't think he, that's not even an argument. All you got to do is look at what did they do. If there's going to be a baptism, guess how you're going to be baptized? You know why? Because I got to believe on him through their word. If they preach that, then I got to believe that 
And I'm going to do that. There's no argument about it. Why am I arguing about it? Somebody said, well, you know, I'm going to believe what Jesus said. If you're going to believe what Jesus said, what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19 is not what Jesus prayed for in John 17. He made a statement in Matthew. Go you therefore, teaching, baptizing, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now I've had so many people used to fight me over there. Well, I'm on, I believe what it said in red. Let me tell you something. The Bible wasn't written in red. <laughs> and if it was written in red, then the next scripture in John cancels out the one that was written in Matthew 28, 19. doesn't cancel it out, but gives us a little bit more understanding of what it was saying. So now... I'm not just talking about uh, believing because it's written in red. Number one, let me just tell y'all, King James them done a good job in putting red lettering in the Bible, but that doesn't have any more weight than the black letters. Okay? It doesn't have any more weight. It does, just because it's written in red doesn't mean anything at all. It means it's still the Word of God. And so I'm not taking and saying that the weight of my belief is weighted up on that which is written in red. But if you do, weigh, it all, weigh all the red up. <laughs> and then when I find Jesus praying for a certain thing, I really want to take attention to that. If he's praying about something, then I want to hear his prayer. I understand this rest reason why now. You know why I don't worry about the devil getting me? You, you, you remember when, when, when Simon Peter was, was shooting off at the mouth and talking about almost beating his chest like Tarzan, you know, trying to tell everybody how, Jesus, I don't care what happened, I'm with you always, and, you know, you got to worry about it. And then Jesus said, you know, hey, Pete, guess what? The devil has desire to sift you like wheat. But then you know what the next verse said? You know what the next part said? But I prayed for you. <laughs> now, now would we be so uh, uninformed to believe that the prayers of Jesus cannot be answered? Would you believe that if he prayed, there would be no answer? If Jesus prayed, do you believe that his prayers are going to be answered? You know why they're going to be answered? Because he's the one that answers prayer. And I can't believe that he would make a prayer request, pray, and his prayer would not be answered. So if he prayed for Pete, because everybody in the kingdom of God, really, believe it or not, there was an adversary, there is an adversary that desire to sift you like wheat. But guess what? You know why he can't? Because Jesus prayed for you. Even when you think you almost going down for the last time, guess what? Always remember, he prayed for me too. All right? Because I'm not just praying for these, but I'm praying for all of them that will believe on me through their word. All right? So you're already in his prayer. If you believe in his word, you're already in his prayer. You're already protected by prayers that you have never seen prayed. You're already. That's why even the Bible tells you, you, you don't even know what you ought to pray for. But since I've come in, since I've set up shop in you, I know what you have need of even when you don't know what you have need of. I, and I, I'm praying in your stead. I'm praying in a seat in your life, praying for things that you have no idea what you have need of. You don't even know how to pray. That's why the Bible says the Holy Ghost in you with moanings and groanings make intercession for you because it's the Spirit of God that searches the deep things of God and of man. And there are certain things I think I might need. That's not really what I need. I, as a human being, we got more needs than a centipede with fall notches. Don't we? Every morning we wake up, guess what? I need something. 
I need something. Do you really? Guess what you need every morning when you get up? You need Jesus. Yes, yeah, that's number one when you wake up. You need him, first of all. But then you need to take the next breath, too. Because <laughs> if that's your last one, that ain't too good. And sometimes people call you and say, how you doing? I say, well, I just took another breath. How's that? Got to be doing better. Because that next breath is very important. If you don't believe me, just skip it. Praise God. Anyway, the, in, in, in Romans chapter 16, I think like I was telling you the other day, Paul is probably one of the most powerful apostles where he was because of his calling and what he was called to do. And I, I could go back and, and trace his tribe back, but that's unnecessary tonight. Maybe we'll get into it next time. But when he made his comment about him being a Hebrew, Hebrew, Pharisee, Pharisee, you know, of the tribe of Benjamin, that's very important, tribe of Benjamin, because one of the things the tribe of Benjamin meant is that, I, you know, the mama, when she had him, she was hurting. She would call him son of my sorrow, Ben Amy. But, uh, <laughs> but when uh, Jacob named him, he named him Benjamin, which meant son of my right hand. So the tribe of Benjamin is going to be a powerful tribe. Matter of fact, it was one of the only tribes that stayed in Jerusalem along with Judah to protect the temple. So that was important. That was on the back table, I think. Some paper. Don't, don't, you ain't, ain't going to find nothing over there like that because, see, oh, hey, that, that's, that's real special stuff right there. Praise God. Anyway. Mm, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know. Something on the front, though. <laughs> All right. Let's turn to Romans chapter 16. Here is Paul. I love Paul. Paul had a, a very unique ministry. And I don't think many times we, we see that in the beginning because most of Paul's ministry in his early stages, Paul, even though he knew what God had told him, he still had a passion in him to want to do just the opposite. Paul was obedient, but yet disobedient. Because what Paul wanted to do versus what, you know, it's just like us. We get a little taste of the Holy Ghost and we, you know, we, we, we have a passion and we want to do something for God. And Paul did. When Paul got saved, the first thing he wanted to do was go back to Jerusalem. You know why he wanted to go back to Jerusalem? Because all his homies was there. Okay? He wanted to go back and get them converted. This thing was so good. You know, when I got my first experience with God, it was so good. I, I thought I was losing my mind. I went around and told all my friends because I wanted them to get some of this. Paul, when he got his experience, the first thing he wanted to do, God done told him, I, I'm gonna, you know, you're going to be an, a, an apostle to the Gentiles. I'm going to show you the thing. You're going to suffer for my name's sake. Well, you got to understand. First of all, you got to understand the Jewish mindset. For a Jewish person to have dealings with Gentiles was one of kind of like the lowest thing they could do. Matter of fact, they named Gentiles dogs. So they really, for a, a Jewish person to literally embrace a Gentile was just totally unheard of. Even Pete had a problem with that. All of them had a problem because you got to understand the Jewish mentality. They were not an exclusion club. It was an inclusion. They believed, you know, we are the people. We need to keep a boundary on this thing. We need to make sure that we are the people of God. We don't want nobody else really to get it, especially the Gentiles. We don't want them in there because this is ours because they have felt like over the years they've been persecuted by Gentiles. They've been taken over by Gentiles. The Romans already had them under their thumb and it seemed like everywhere since they left, since Solomon Day, when they experienced the peace, and then all of a sudden, ever since then, it's been hell in the camp. It's been Syrians. It's been uh, 
uh, Medes and Persians. It's been all these different kingdoms rising up and putting them in subjection, making them more like slaves more than the people of God. The only good thing about when they went into captivity is that people still kind of respected the God they served because they had heard too many stories about what their God could do to people. And so even when they got ready to come into the promised land, most of them people were scared half to death over there because they had heard what God done to the Egyptians. That's why they had the city, walls closed up, doors closed up. Don't let these people come here because they come in here, guess what? They're God to be fighting for them. And so God takes, uh, even in that, it was one, one, you know, God has a great sense of humor because here they're expecting these people to be such powerful people, but they really wasn't that powerful, just regular old people, just following God. And so God uses different kind of warfare. This reason why today you can't get stuck in a, in a rut on thinking you know how God ought to move. God has multiple facets of ways. Now, God could have probably built something or had something to go in and knock everything down, but he didn't. Instead, he had people just walking around the wall. Can you believe? Would you do that? God tell you, I'm going to give you that city. All you got to do is walk around the wall. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> The real test wasn't the walking. <laughs> the real test was the talking. <laughs> All you got to do, I don't want you to say nothing. Just walk around the wall. Now at first, at first they probably went real good because everybody's peeping. Second day, they're still peeping. But about the third day, they don't start gawking and laughing. What you doing? What you walking around the wall for? You want to say something so bad. You want to say something. Have you ever had somebody goad you so bad you just want it? You know, already bit your lip, blood's coming out your bottom lip because you want to say something. You know what I'm saying? And they probably got even uglier, started throwing stuff down on them. And guess what, God? Guess what? God never changed his mind. If I hold my peace, <laughs> let the Lord fight my battle. Victory, victory shall be mine. And they walked and walked until God finally told them, it's time to shout. Who ever heard? of someone shouting, and the walls looked like they had A-bombs on them. It's imploded, fell down to the ground, flat down. But that's the way God is. Like I said before, one thing you got to do, when you're following God, you got to follow instruction. It ain't like you think it's going to be. Don't try to get your victory. You got to get in his victory. Many times we're sitting here trying to claim our victory. No. Don't claim yours, claim his. That's not one thing that you're in right now. He ain't already been victorious over. Hello? He's already got the victory that you're trying to get. Oh, I got to get my victory. I got to get my victory. That's the reason why you had to work hard to get yours. But if you would rest with him, you can see your victory in him because that's where my victory lies. I am not, uh, I'm not victorious because I got the victory. I'm victorious because he got the victory. He had the victory before I showed up. When it looked like I was losing, I was still winning. Again, I'm not fighting to get victory. I fight from a place of victory. I don't go into a fight wondering if I'm going to win. I'm coming in a winner, knowing that I have already won. The way you show up really tells where you are. Well, I can't stop till I get the victory. No, 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 no. I'm fighting from victory. When I come out hooking, I'm hooking already from victory. You know, it's like me having all my homies, all 75 of my homies, and you got one little dude out here. 
I'm, I'm not fighting from a lost position. The odds are on my side. Matter of fact, if I'm with Jesus, he is the majority. I got more on my side than the enemy has on him. Here is Paul. That's just a little salutation, whatever you want to call it. What I say, 15, no, 16, 25, 26. Uh, and Paul talks a lot about the grace of God. I, I didn't realize it until after I began to see it. You know how you read stuff, you never see it, never even really see it because you're not looking for it. I never realized how many times Paul even used the word grace in his teaching and preaching, and there's no such thing under the old covenant as grace. They really don't have an, a real clear picture of grace, even though grace has always been, even though grace has always was, but you don't hear grace being explored or explained in the old covenant, even though they were experiencing grace because really if they hadn't had a little grace in the old covenant, they'd been all dead, right? So it was always there. And when Moses disobeyed God and hit that rock the second time, you know what saved him? Grace would have to save him, right? So everywhere you look in the Bible, even though it's not talked about, it's not said, but yet underneath it all, you know that it was the grace of God working. And a lot of times we don't see the grace of God. Even in the law, we, we, uh, we support the law and put it all the way up here and not understanding no man could keep it. So if no man could keep it, guess what's keeping you since you ain't keeping it? Because the only penalty for breaking the law of God, there's only one. It's death. Right? The soul that sentence. Said what? Yeah, D D. Dead. <laughs> and that was the only reward, that's the only compensation, that's the only paycheck you can get from sin. It was death. So if a person fell, even though they could die, but yet what happened is you see the grace of God. Because God should have killed them on the spot. Now there were some in there that didn't experience the grace. You remember the one little boy went out on, on Sunday to get the chicken dinner ready? He went and picked the sticks up. Remember that? <laughs> Would you kill somebody over picking up a stick? That was, one, that was one of the first sins that happened to show you how stringent the law was. You know, it, it, it don't even seem, it don't even seem right that all you done was picked up some sticks. You didn't cut down a tree. You probably walked along seeing the sticks. Picked them up, took them home, but you couldn't pick up sticks on a Sabbath day. And guess what they done? Had a council meeting. And they say, you know, they took them outside the gate and put rocks on it. Can you see your child dying over something like that? Sometimes we don't understand how great the grace of God is and how great his mercy is. Because here's a young man who was made an example. Nothing more than picking up a stick and he got a rock concert in his honor, which he was a center of attraction and got killed. There's a lot of things in the Bible. It's like people talking about, well, I believe in the literal Bible. No, you don't. No, you don't. I know better. You know what the Bible says if you got a disobedient son, what are you supposed to do? Oh, no, 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 no. They had no worse than that. No, you, you're right. They beat him. You got to beat him with a rod. But he had another one before that. Under the law, you know what you had to do if, you're, if you had a child and you couldn't do nothing with him. And they're disobedient. You know what you're supposed to do to them? You're supposed to go to the elders of the city and tell them, I have a real hard head here. And we need to handle him. You know how they handled 
bad kids, baby kids. Took them right outside the city. You didn't have no more hard haired kids. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the parent, yeah, had to be the first one to throw the rock. Could you do that? Could you? We'd be doing what we're doing right now, covering up for our bad kids. <laughs> they ain't bad. They ain't that bad. But the Bible said if they're disobedient, they spoke. Yeah. I, I, it's, I will bring it back to you, but I can't right now pull it up on the screen. I, I, it just came to me while I was talking about it because I'm trying to show you a lot of time when people want to be so literal and you want to do what God said, and then when it comes time you do what God said, you're not going to do what God said. If you're taking this book literal and you got a bad, disobedient child, you need to call somebody. Y'all need to go out and rock it. But then you're going to go to jail. You go to jail now for just whooping them. Here we go. Well, bro, Wilson, you know, we don't have to whoop them anymore. We just talk to them. See, but the Bible says so. Foolishness is in the heart of a child. Time out, don't get it out. <laughs> Sitting in the corner, don't get it out. You ground it, don't get it out. <laughs> Take it away to a little tablet. Do not get it out. Guess what the Bible says? Gets it out. There is a thing called the gluteus maxim. It's called the seat of education. It's a teaching point. <laughs> he said, if you hit that just right, it'll drive all the foolishness out. <laughs> but you know what we've done? We tried everything but that. We want to try all Dr. Spock's mess. We want to try all these other psychiatric things they done told us about. Well, if you beat the kid, you're going to make him violent. That's a lie. Well, it, man, I got, whoo. Y'all don't even understand what a whooping is. <laughs> I can't say I wasn't violent, though. <laughs> But it did take the foolishness out. At least when I acted a fool, I knew when to act a fool. Right? See, we're, well, anyway, that's, I ain't even on that. Let's read this. He said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. Now notice, Paul is taking, putting his name on this thing. Because God really gave him a gospel to preach. He was anointed to preach the gospel. He was anointed to preach the gospel to the Gentile. Like I said before, he wanted his homers to be saved. He went back to try to get them saved, and boy, did it cost him. Boy, did it cost him. Man, he got his head combed all the time. They were trying to kill him because he thought the people would love the message, but they didn't love the message. They, didn't, they hated the message because... It was not what they had heard or was grown up on. It wasn't what they had in their mentality. They could not see God letting somebody else into this thing. They couldn't see that. They didn't see God turn the world over to someone else other than them. The whole thing was one day we shall rule the whole world, but what they didn't understand, God never intended for a man to rule it by flesh. And so that's why even today, that's why every country today is building up missiles. And they're building more guns. And you know what they say they're doing it for? To keep the peace. <laughs> now, you know, that's, that's kind of like me walking here tonight with AK-47. 
blow up in the ceiling a couple of times. I said, now, do y'all love me? Now, what are you going to say? You see that? And I'm going to walk in and say, buddy, love me because I came in there with the peacekeeper. <laughs> and the peacekeeper is supposed to make you be at peace. Well, see, that's the whole thing. It's when you start a praying, we're praying for war. We're praying that we be victorious in the war. All these things we pray about fleshly doesn't have any spiritual value because it does not ever develop in anything spiritual. There is no peace with God. Peace is not something you're going to force. Jesus Christ came without any pistols. He didn't have no bazookas, no missiles. And he get up and he said, my peace I give unto you. Not like the world give, but I'm giving my peace. As Christian people, we need to be real careful. Don't get too political. Because when you get too political, you're going to mess around and get too literal. And then you're going to start to believe in that God is blessing America when really he's only blessing his people in America. Okay, Deuteronomy 21. There you go. Sometimes you need to go back and read some of this stuff because a lot of times when people tell me you believe in literal stuff, I ain't seen you practice none of that. You say, I believe what God said didn't do that then. But then that's the reason why we better know. First of all, the difference in these covenants, difference in what God was saying and what it really, as it's being revealed, what is being said because it was said. I got to know that. I cannot go back in the old covenant and, and turn around and say, well, move into a house. Uh, what they say, you couldn't have uh, the eaves on your house had to be different. All kind of things that had to be different. You couldn't. Well, anyway, I, I'm not even trying to bring all that. I'm trying to get across another point tonight. Here he says, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. In other words, is that from the time of Adam up to the time of John the Baptist, last major prophet, Last old covenant prophet, John the Baptist. There was none greater, none born of a woman that was greater than John the Baptist. All these things that these apostles are going to see has been kept secret. The, the prophets preached about it, prophesied about it, but they didn't know what they were prophesying about because it was a mystery. They didn't have the understanding of what they were even prophesying about. But by the Spirit of God, they were putting in the prophetic word, they was writing it down, and still, even getting it right, they didn't know what it really meant. So what Paul is saying, this, this thing has been kept secret since the world began, but now has been revealed. The mystery has been revealed. But now it's made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. In other words, if you get through reading all the old covenant and somehow you didn't pick up this, all it was about was really bringing people to the obedience of faith. That's why the Bible say the law, Jesus Christ, become the end of the law to them that Believe, because the law was put in place to bring you to where? Come on, don't, don't be ashamed. Get it out. Christ, the law, its purpose was to make you see how much you needed Jesus. In the end. Because when you got through looking at 613 different ordinances of God, Jesus looked real pretty when all I had to do was go to him and believe. 
And then I had to worry about the 613, which one did I miss today? Then I got to worry about, did I get it all right? Did I do it good enough? So the whole law, you were never going to be able to keep it. You were never going to be able to uphold the whole law. He knew that. But he wanted you to see your need for a Savior. He wanted you to see that all them lambs you were sacrificing, all them goats, were still when you got to sacrificing the goat, you still got this mind that walked away the same before you showed up, still messed up. How many people go to church even today and don't realize is that all your personal sacrifices that you're making, thinking that you're improving your status with God, that's why you're frustrated now because when you made all those sacrifices, you still walked away wondering, did I do enough to get in? Man, in the songs that you'd sing, oh, if I could just make it, if I could just make, if I could just make it in, and the Bible says there is an abounding entrance. So how are you barely making it in? Well, anyway, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay. Hit me. Okay, that, let, 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 me, let me get you there. You're right, because that's a good scripture. But you know what? Now, he, who is he talking to at this time? Because now, now Jerusalem is going to be attacked. They're going to be destroyed. What we're going to find out as we be, begin to translate these scriptures out, we're going to find out that now one is leading, one is going down, the one is going down. If you end up in there, that's going to be a whole bunch of them ain't going to make it out. Scarcely be saved. But now when we get past that and get into the book of Revelation, look what we have. There is a number which no man can count. So I, be, I got to be able to reconcile the fact that he says, now there is, the, in that day, the righteous shall scarcely be saved. I need to know what day that is. Because when Jesus opened up the floodgates and he made his invitation, let them come. See, the only people that could be destroyed is the people that did not compromise under that covenant and receive the new covenant that God was giving to them. See, their salvation was never going to be under the old covenant. Their salvation was in Jesus Christ. The part they missed, that's why he said, if you don't believe that I am he, you shall die in your sin. Guess what all of Jerusalem believed? Most of Jerusalem believed. They still believe what Moses taught them. When Jesus would try to talk to them, you know what they'd always say? M Moses said, but he said, but, but I say. Each time they would bring a point, Moses said, Moses said that in this law that if a man die, if another man die, and she takes this way, which one's going to be? And they, they was just all off in everything because they're trying to understand something literal, which was real spiritual. They couldn't understand that. They kept trying to make the Jerusalem of old be the Jerusalem of new. They really believed that God would never destroy that Jerusalem. So in, in the Matthew, in the Gospels, what we are still under in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're still under the old covenant. What the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is giving them the message to get them out from under the old covenant. They need to hear what Jesus is saying. That's why Jesus is here three and a half years. What is he doing? Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what is he telling them? That's a new thing coming on the scene. It's right at your fingertips. You can reach out and grab it. So when you go back there and realize that now when he gets ready to destroy Jerusalem, the only people going to get out of Jerusalem is the one that really believed him. 
And they're, they're, they're going to be tested so, so much is that they're going to almost, their faith is almost going to fail because of things that's happening to them. Almost like when it came out of Egypt. Guess what it came out of Egypt with? Now the first four, I think the first three plagues was hitting God's people too. It, it shook them up. But if you hold on, endure until the end. The end of what? To the end of what I'm doing with this covenant. If you can hold on, the same shall be saved. Because once we leave the old covenant, the new Savior now becomes Jesus. He is the Savior of the world. So he shows, number one, when he made a promise to Abraham way back in the 15th chapter, I think, or 12th of Genesis, where he said to Abraham, I got two kind of seeds. He said, I want you to look at the seashore. If you can count the grains of sand, that's how multiplicity or multitude in this my seed is. Look, in the star, look up at the heaven and count the stars. Can you count the stars? So now, even in Abraham, Prophetic or prophecy, God is talking about two different kinds of people. He got a people from earth and he got a people from heaven or a people that's above. Just like he had even in the two women. Hagar was from beneath. Sarah was from above. Promise. So when he speaks to the people that's Below, because flesh has got to give way to spirit. Flesh have to give way. That's why John the Baptist say, I must decrease so that he can what? Increase. He have to increase. Even now, you should have said the same thing. I need to decrease. Because if I want to see more of Jesus in my life, I got to see less of me. Because the more of me I see, the less of Jesus I can even behold. The mirror, mirror on the wall that's telling you you're the fairest of them all. <laughs> if you don't see Jesus, it's lying. <laughs> Oh, mirror, mirror on the wall, am I not the fairest of them all? Oh, thy queen, no. <laughs> so here's Paul, uh, made known, or trying to make known unto all nations the obedience of faith. Everybody said obedience. obedience. All right. See, faith, faith has to have obedience in it. Without obedience, there's really no faith in and not just obeying, but obeying the right way because that's how faith is operating. You have to have, you got to believe in the right thing. You know, Eve was obedient to eat from the tree, but disobedient to God. But she's obedient to another voice. You can be obedient to what you think you hear. You got to make sure, that's why the Bible says, what should you do when something comes your way? Try the Spirit. Try the spirit and see whether or not it be of God, right? But you know what? We won't do that. Because you, if it comes and it feels good and sounds good, guess you, you know what we'll do? It's got to be God. Huh? It's got to be God because it, it sounded too good not to be God. And generally when God will speak, he never speaks the stuff that I want to hear. That, that's the reason why a lot of times I hate to go to him because I already know what he's going to say. <laughs> Uh-oh, here we go. I know what he's going to say because he ain't going to change his mind. No matter how I try to make him change his mind, he won't change his mind. So when I go to him, I already know. I went one time, tried to pray against a guy. I felt like he misused me. And I, I, I don't even know why I was praying. You know why I was praying? Because I wanted God to hate him. You know why I wanted God to hate him? Because he'd mess with me. And I believed I was one of God's favorites. See, I grew up being the pet in the family. 
So you know how spoiled. God had teach me a whole lot of things coming in this. I mean, one time I got down, I wanted to pray against the guy, and I wanted to pray. I got down to pray, and all I could do was cry and cry. Then when I got up off of there, I knew then, wasn't no way I'm going to be able to get that prayer through that I wanted to get through because God had already let me see the prayer he wanted me to pray was not the prayer that I wanted to pray. There's a big difference when God gets in it versus when you're all up in it. There's a big difference. Let's turn to uh, 2 Ephesians chapter 3. I mean, that's another book. <laughs> you probably ain't got it in your Bibles. That's that new rendition. And, and, and again, you know, uh, the, the, really you need to get your faith anchored, concreted, anchored in Jesus. More than anything, praying, Lord, I just want to know you because you need to know that because there's so many things right now that will mess you up if you don't. You need to know him. You need to know him more than you know the maps in the Bible. Some people are concerned about where Megiddo was or where it is and where it's going to be. I'm not concerned about none of that because I got Jesus now. Wherever he is, that's where I am. Is that not as he is? So are we going to be? Huh? Not going to be? Oh. Let's, let's stop for just a minute now. As he is, so are we. Now, let me ask you. Just, I just want you to say that real slow again. Now, say it like this. As he is, so is me. I know it sounds good, but I want you to think about it for a minute. Where are you sitting at right now? I mean, where, where are you at right now? I'm talking about on your, in your mental arena. Because you said, as he is, not going to be. As he is right now, so are we. That's powerful. Because you know what? I think yesterday I almost got depressed. How many of y'all think Jesus is sitting down in depression today? How many of you think Jesus is sitting down in worry? How many of you think Jesus is scared today? As he is. Now I'll say so is me, cause, cause see, when you say we, sometimes don't mean everybody. This is what makes the scriptures important. You got to make it real to you. See, in this little group session right now, it's only natural you're gonna say so are we. <laughs> but then when you really break it down, if you really break it down, you know where you're sitting right now. Now you know Jesus ain't sitting here shook all up. Hmm? He ain't got to worry. He ain't got to care. So to say that and to really understand it and mean that, because as he is, wherever he is right now, so are we in this present world. No? If you're not sure, hold your head in a circle. That way you're neither saying yes or no. You're neither sitting nor standing. So here in Ephesians chapter 3, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now I'm going to tell you something here. Bad as I hate bondage, Nobody likes to be enslaved, do they? 
Don't you hate to be in bondage? But it's one thing when you hook up with Jesus, man, you tied down. Paul even talked about one time, he said, I, I've been apprehended. That word apprehended means get arrested. <laughs> I've been arrested by something that I'm trying to still figure out how to get to arrest what arrested me. That which have a hold of me, I'm trying to figure out how to get a hold of it. So you've already been arrested by God. You've already been read your rights. <laughs> Fingerprinted and mugshot. <laughs> now you're just trying to figure out how to get a hold of what got a hold of you. I know he got me, but I just got to figure out how to really get a hold of him. That's why in this walk with God, it's not, if you don't discover what got you, you'll never know what's got you. You can walk around and speak in tongues and not realize that it's even deeper than me speaking in tongues. And I love to speak in tongues, but it's deeper than tongues. Something got a hold of me. And I'm trying to figure out how can I get a hold of that which got a hold of me. Because in getting a hold of that, I'm going to discover what got a hold of me and what got a hold of me, what it's given me. Praise God. Paul said, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you work. In other words, Paul is looking at this as a dispensation of grace that's been awarded to him. He's going to preach it to the Gentiles. They're going to hear the word and they're going to believe. How that by revelation, how, how do you get it? You know what Paul was reading? You know what books Paul was reading? Do you, would you know which books he would have been reading as a Christian? Do you know what his study material would have been? He would have been reading the Old Testament. And so that means that Paul has got to go into the Old Testament and draw from there the grace of God, explain it using the Old Testament. And there's not one person in the Bible that was good as that as Paul was. Matter of fact, there were places in, in the book of Romans, I don't know how many times he got in here, he will bring a scripture out and go back and quote it from the Old Testament and show you how it's fulfilled in the New Testament, just like uh, in the book of Acts when, when Peter's getting ready to preach on the day of Pentecost, he goes back to the prophet Joel. This is that. See, they never understood. They've been reading the book of Joel forever. They had no idea what the book of Joel was about because they could only understand it from a natural standpoint. But when the day of Pentecost come and the Holy Ghost is poured out, then Pete steps up and says, you know, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, whoo, whoo, in the last days, last days of what? You go back and read it. All you got to do is go back and start reading them old covenant. They saw a destruction coming. In the last days of what? It was the last days of the old covenant. It was in the last days of the old covenant. I'm going to pour out my spirit up on all flesh. They would have never understood that. Jesus made little comments about like, he that believeth on me, as scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow. Do you think they understood that? No. That which is, you need to be born again. You think they understood that? No, they didn't. Even the great teacher didn't understand it. He said, I'm being old. Can I go back in my mother's womb? They're literal. They're thinking. Born again? We never heard no stuff like that. Born again? What do you mean? You mean to tell me I need to go back up in my mother's womb and get birthed again? No. He said, you, verily I say to you, you must be 
born again, born of water and spirit. You think he understood it? No. He said, in order for you to enter into this kingdom, you've got to be born again. In order for you to see this kingdom, you've got to be born again. They couldn't see the kingdom. They didn't have the spirit to see the kingdom. But they needed to be birthed again. That's the reason why now. Don't fight them. You've got to be born again. If you're going to get in, you need to be born again. If you're going to see the kingdom, you need to be born again. Because that which is born of flesh and that which is born of spirit. How many of you know this kingdom is a spiritual kingdom? What is the kingdom of God? It's righteousness, peace, and joy. Where? In the flesh? Well, why is it we trying to get joy in the flesh? Why are we trying to get peace in the flesh? Because it ain't going to happen in the flesh. It's going to happen in the spirit. And unless I can get peace in my spirit, I ain't going to have no peace. The peace of God is not given to your flesh. Matter of fact, in the old covenant, they were not allowed to put any anointing oil on your flesh. When they anointed a priest, they could only put the oil on the garment. They could only put the oil on the position, but they never put it on a man's flesh. There's no such thing as anointed flesh unless your name is Adolf Hitler. He's not trying to anoint your flesh. And this is why we get messed up in church because we want anointed flesh. We want God to anoint our flesh when God came to anoint your spirit. He wanted that anointing to give you righteousness, peace, and joy. That's why we, when we get to a place in our flesh gets really messed up and we can't find no peace, we give up. But if you had his peace, I ain't going to tell you storm stop. I'm not going to tell you that you're not going to have full flat tire. I'm not going to tell you that the dog ain't going to die in the backyard. I ain't going to tell you none of that. But whatever happens in your life, you will be able to endure because of peace. When you make peace your priority, it becomes your referee for life. A matter of fact, I try to live my life today. If it don't bring me peace, I'm going to wave goodbye. If there's no peace in it, I ain't got to worry about it. Because I operate. My referee of my life is peace. Because the first thing God came to give you when he came in your life was peace. The first message to earth, peace and goodwill. To who? To all men. Now, he is still giving peace and goodwill. So if you don't have no peace, that means, no, I'm not going to tell you you don't have no Jesus. What I am going to tell you, though, you need to let Jesus rise up in you. Because if he gets up, it's got to be peace. All right? He's not going to have a whole lot of situation like that where you don't have no peace. Let me keep reading. Two, what did I say two what now? I keep getting off. Okay. Among whom also we all had our conversation time past and the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. He's looking at, I'm in Ephesians, second Ephesians chapter two. <laughs> no, Ephesians chapter two. I'm at verse three. But God, who is rich in mercy. 
How many people always talk about the blessings of God? How many of you know that God does have riches he want to share that you can't buy at Walmart, even on a rollback? See, there are some riches in God that we, we're talking about the wealth and the riches of God. Most of the time, when we say those things, we can only equate to God by the amount of our paychecks. The paycheck is what really determines how blessed we are in most people's circles. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, you ain't got to say yes. I know. I know. But, but it's true. Because if we got a good job and got good money and making good money, guess what we say? Still blessed. But there are a lot of other riches that you, you probably abort and, 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 abort, abort and uh, uh, bypass because you don't know their riches. One of the things God was rich in, he's richer than he was probably in gold. He was rich in mercy. The Bible talks about the riches of his grace. Have you ever explored those things? You ever explored what the riches of his mercy is? Riches of his grace? Have you ever under, tried to understand the riches of his wisdom? Now these are things that the moth can't break in and steal. These are things that no one can take from you. These riches I'm talking about you ain't got to worry about the internal revenue coming and, and possessing it. But we don't care for those riches, especially if we live in literal, because our whole world is about the literal existence, and we are always trying to make the literal existence better than our spiritual existence. And so, yes, if I get a check and it's big, don't get me wrong, I count it as a blessing, but I, I know there's a greater blessing than just me getting that. I know there's a greater blessing than that. I'm not going to live my life waiting for the lottery to hit or something. I'm not counting that as a blessing. But there is blessing that God was rich in. He wanted to give to you, share with you the rich, richness of his mercy, richness of his grace. Then he even talked about giving you not just life, but life more abundantly. And yet we see all these things that he wants to give us, but the reason why we don't really go after them, because you really can't see them like you see the others. See, if I get a big old paycheck and get a raise, you know, and gets a little bling bling around my neck, you know I got something. You can see it, right? And you'll say, Man, he got on that long jean watch and got on that Pope ring. <laughs> he sure is blessed. I know he blessed. Shoes shining. I got a $1,500 suit on. Would you call me blessed this morning? Would you call me blessed? I know, I say, I know you. But see, the thing about it, may not even have an ounce of God sense. I just got says I know how to go buy clothes. But I don't have an ounce of God's sense. When it comes down to seeing some manifestation of his spirit, have none of that. Because when it comes time, you know, he even said them one time, go and cry to your gold. Go cry to your silver. See what it answers you. How many of you ever had an expensive watch and prayed to it and it gave you an answer? If you want to ask him for time, <laughs> oh, God, where did time go? Let me finish this right here, though. Praise God. Even but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he, say that next word for me, loved it, loved it. I can't even stress that enough. The revelation. Paul says, loved it. How many of you know what loved it means? Loved it 
Put the ED on it. That means it past tense. But see, what God loved did it in the past because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'd almost believe that he, if he loved it, it me yesterday. He loved it, it today. And he's going to love it, it <laughs> tomorrow. Is that the way you see that? Hmm? So if you see that, then why would you ever doubt? that God could love you in a less today than he did yesterday. How? See, most people think that God didn't see you till you got here. But see, the Lord sees things. He saw the end. From the beginning. So it's not like you showed up and God said, well, I finally found one I can't love to do. Can't do it. God was like blinders on. I'm just going to love every last one of them because I'm going to let them be accepted in the beloved. Boy, we had a revelation. As Paul said, these things, these mysteries had been revealed unto me. These things was hid from in old times. Yes, they had a word. They preached it with fire. But the real substance of the word, they couldn't see. They had no idea of what God was trying to sell them. Had no idea when God had them waving the sheaves the different kinds of sheep, why they was waving the sheep. They had no idea. None. Had no idea why God had a scapegoat. Two goats. On torment day, two goats, not one. One he killed, and the other one he turned loose. Wow. And if you even found the one he turned loose, if you touched it, you were cursed. How does that fit you today? Well, here's how that fits you. He became the goat that died and let you get away. That's why you cannot go back and pick up your old man and touch him again because now you're necromancer. You're worshiping the dead. You are dead in trespasses and sin. The more you try to worship yourself, you put yourself back on the uh, 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 de uh, uh, dead folks' worship. That's why the Bible says, I don't, you can't give God dead works. Where does dead works come from? Where would dead works come from? It would come from a dead person. Where, who is a dead person but who won't believe in faith and believe in Jesus? Because anything you offer God without his spirit, the only thing that lives in you is his spirit. If I offer God something that's not spiritual, then it's dead works. If I tell this church we need to drink seven glasses of Kool-Aid, green Kool-Aid at that every day, so you can be saved, oh, I already know you ain't going to do it. But if I did, and you were just that committed to drinking green Kool-Aid, do you think making your Kool-Aid and drinking your Kool-Aid every day is going to save you? You know what that would amount to? Dead work. 